Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 735. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 7th, 2022. Thank you for joining us in another edition of Anglican Unscripted. You're watching two middle-aged, overweight white men talk about Anglican news and Christian news around the world, and we really appreciate that. Uh, we've been doing this, obviously, now for 735 episodes. Uh, I was looking at the uh, the view count, not because I'm a prideful person or anything like that, but uh, you, you got to know if people was watching. We had uh, the last viral kind of go, or two vi videos ago, vi go viral, and people are saying, hey, this is showing up on my feed. I watched it for the first time, kind of cool. And uh, this is why you, we, we ask you guys to keep sharing it. I think it went viral because of the title. It says, Watching a Dying Church. <laughs> and so something at Google or YouTube uh, put that on everybody's screens uh, last week. And we appreciate that YouTube and Google, but I think they were doing it for the wrong reasons. So, you know, there's that. How have you been doing, George? I'm just great. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. Oh, it's a beautiful day in Florida. Yeah, it is. Uh, people were asking about the update on the RV. Yes, I scratched. Okay, I broke some of the fiberglass on the front of the RV. We filed a claim with Geico. Geico is sending us a check. We made a arrangements to have an estimate at the local RV repair shop who deals with this type of fiberglass issue. And they said you can come sometime in July. Like uh, I made an appointment the early first week. They said we have us fixed and back on the road by the end of July. That's great. And the RV is perfectly drivable. It's a cosmetic issue. And uh, we'll continue our adventure and we'll let you know how we're doing as we do. I do want to bring up an interesting point. Uh, the people at the RV s shop said Geico, Progressive, and all the other insurance agents uh, in COVID times are forcing people to cash the check really quick so they can close the case and, and, and move it on. And then if there is an additional cost that they find at the RV location, um, it takes forever for the RV location or you to get reimbursed. Don't cash the check. I said, that's kind of weird. Well, they won't force me to cash the check. Last night, Geico called, told me how much it's going to be that they're going to give me, and three times this, this morning, they asked me how I want the money. They can wire to me, they can put it in my debit card, and at the very bottom, the last available uh, choice I have in small type, I can have the check mailed to me if I so desire. So, I think the RV <laughs> dealership knows what's going on here. It's COVID times, George. So, let's move on to the news. And it's kind of breaking news because the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has found something unbiblical. And for him, and we've talked about this before, he thinks schism, schism, depending on how you pronounce it, is unbiblical. You know, the, the breaking of the union is more unbiblical than anything else. And Gafcon has struggled to convince um, Justin Welby that, no, there are other things more unbiblical than schism. And I thought we could talk about this because he reveals this in a letter to the archbishops who refused to go to Lambeth 2022. And I think, let's talk about it, George. Yes, a letter was published along with an, a press release from the Anglican Communion News Service saying at the end of May, Justin Welby wrote to the archbishops of Rwanda, Nigeria, and, Ken and Uganda, saying very strong things about their decision not to come to the Lambeth Conference. He started off by saying that their approach is unbiblical, that Christ is not proclaimed by boycotts, and that we need to more, be in unity with one another, and their decision to stay away was contrary to the words of Scripture in the Gospels. He then went on to, cat, uh, cat, uh, to condemn the Church of Nigeria for false statements. The Archbishop of Nigeria, Ndekuba, Henry Ndekuba, in a May 8th letter to his church, you know, mentioned that the Church of England has abandoned uh, traditional Christian teachings on human sexuality. And I guess technically that is not true. Uh, no, no, they no have changed a, they, the prayer well, books in May. Hold on. They have abandoned the teaching, they haven't changed the teaching. I think he's, he's, the, the Archbishop is correct. 
Which archbishop? Uh, uh, the African one, yes. Both archbishop, <laughs> the African one. Well, and Justin was also correct because the prayer book has not been changed. Right. And now, forget the. Now, but then we would have to leave aside one fact that the open toleration of clergy and same sex uh, partnerships uh, that started years ago with allowing clergy and civil unions, same sex civil unions, and then uh, saying, well, so long as they're chaste. Well, that was a big wink, wink, nod, nod, lie. We saw that most particularly with Sherry Van, who now is Bishop of Monmouth in the Church in Wales. She was mm -hmm. in a civil union, was on the Archbishop's Council, but everybody on the Archbishop's Council knew that she was not, uh, well, I don't know how they would know, but she was not chaste. This was not a, uh, uh, a sisterly relationship she was in. So the Church of England has tolerated this, and now their Living in Love and Faith program is uh, basically unfolding itself slowly, and the church is going to have some other model to basically try to square the circle of those who demand it now and those who say this is unbiblical. So both archbishops are right. Uh, Henry and de Cuba saying the church has abandoned traditional moral teaching, mm -hmm. uh, and Justin Welby who says, well, we've not abandoned Lambeth 110. And then he says, and the Lambeth Conference hasn't abandoned 110 look, we're not allowing gay spouses to come. Which begs the question, what about the gay bishops? <laughs> the newest gay bishop is the Bishop of Connecticut, Bishop-elect of Connecticut. He'll be consecrated in time to go to this, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think so. And the, and here's, uh, they're allowed to come, they're allowed, they're not under any penalty as uh, Gene Robinson was mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in 2008. Uh, so again, this is sort of disingenuous on Justin Welby's part. And then he goes on to say, and we are appalled that you African bishops think that issues of poverty, economic injustice, and the environment are peripheral issues at a conference like this. We think they're the central issues. Now, this plays into the uh, stereotype that when Justin Welby celebrates Holy Communion, he doesn't want to distribute the body of love. Christ. He wants to distribute condoms, mosquito nets, and pamphlets. Uh, but the church, you know, there's such a fundamental, it's not that the Nigerians don't care about the economy or the Ugandans about the environment. They do deeply, and they do great many works in these areas, but rather the faith once delivered by the saints, they do not believe can be compromised by the culture and the world around us. Well, and this is what the Church of England is doing. That kind of they brings do. about a greater conversation. What is the purpose of the Church, which should be the same purchase, purpose of the Communion? And uh, if I remember my Acts 2, uh, the purpose of the Church is to devote themselves to the Apostles' teaching, to break bread together, to fellowship. Um, there's something else that I'm forgetting. And go and make disciples. Yes. And, go and make disciples. And so, you know, the, 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 I know there's several places in the New Testament where the purpose of the church is identified. And, you know, the majority and the most important thing to do is to fellowship, to worship God, to, uh, to teach the apostles' teaching, and to act out the apostles' teaching. And as you get down to the bottom, yes, serve the widows, the orphans, the hungry, the poor, um, and all those things. But if you're not conducting under the Apostles' teaching, you're doing the feeding of the orphans, the widows, and the poor for the wrong reasons. You're doing it for the same reason the state does. And that's we're not supposed to do it for the reason the state does, or the government does, or the monarchy does. We're supposed to do it for the reason that Christ wants us to do it. And uh, if you can't get those in the right order, you're going to do what you're doing now, Justin, and make uh, schism the worst sin. Well, the, there's a fundamental world break of worldviews here between the Justin Welby and the African bishops. Mm -hmm. Welby believes in the primacy of social justice as the message of the gospel. Sure. Well, the African primates believe that the person and work of Jesus Christ is the primary message of the gospel. And so Welby believes he's being faithful to the gospel by pushing social justice initiatives. Uh, and I jokingly mentioned mosquito nets and condoms, but population control, disease control, environmental, you know, global warming, all this and that. We had a recent group of English clergy petition uh, 
the, the Church of England to recognize the uh, Rose clergy who were chaining themselves uh, or blocking traffic or uh, disrupting railroad traffic or chaining themselves to nuclear reactor fences to save the environment. That would be considered slightly mad in a church in Africa where the primacy of the person and work of Jesus Christ is front and center and everything mm. else is peripheral. You can save so, the yes. environment. Yeah, well, yeah, the message of the gospel is you save the environment by saving the souls. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how you and save the environment. So the, the worldviews are so very different at this stage uh, that uh, we're not in the same church. We may... We may uh, dress alike, we may use same books, but our languages are so very different and then the understanding of what's going on. Mark Dury, an Australian uh, theologian who wrote, writes most, uh, mostly about Islam, but also had an article about saying, you know, this all goes back to Immanuel Kant. This is 200 years in the making. The, dis the, the divide between the secular world and the spiritual world and now we're at a place where the secular world has infested so much of the spiritual oh, church uh, world. Yeah. And the church has agreed to the redefinitions of words that the secular world has proposed. Women means, mm -hmm. what a woman means is uh, completely different now than it was five years ago. Um, this whole new woke culture that's introducing a new language and uh, kind of redefining the role of father, of mother, of child, of government, of church, uh, in a way that is set to destroy so they can have another revolution and another rebellion and a, another step to their, you know, their paradise and our dystopia, you know. I, Kevin, do you remember a number of years ago, I do miss Catherine Jefford Shorey because she was just an ongoing font of joy for us reporters. She was, yes. You, she preached a sermon uh, from the Book of Acts about Paul casting out the spirit of divination, the python, from the slave girl in Philippi. Mm -hmm. And Catherine, and usually most Orthodox Christians talk about this as Paul uh, battling the forces of darkness and proclaiming the exclusiveness of Jesus Christ and all this. Well, Catherine Jefferson complained that Paul was a male chauvinist who was jealous of a woman who also had spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. Never mind, they were satanic. And, you know, this sounds ludicrous to us when we were talking about it seven, eight years ago, but it's actually mainstreamed at this page, when that, I that type of lunacy. When I first read the story, I thought it was, you know, a Babylon Bee type thing. Nobody is that uninformed about the difference between righteousness and evil to preach a sermon like that. And you assured me your sources were genuine when you wrote the thing and you provided me the text and the audio to it. And I don't know, the fact that the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time did not respond to it, uh, that even uh, Gafcon did not respond to it, um, I don't know. It was just I, surprising. I, a, you know. a little personal vignette about how this world has changed. Growing up, my wife and daughters would watch religiously a show of uh, Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders making the team, wow. where they would follow. Uh, they would follow these girls who were trying out for the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, and it was all about hair and exercise and dance technique, and all the girls were had to be chased and couldn't fraternize with the player. I mean, was the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders? <laughs> you know, the image that I portray. Sure. Uh -huh. I on Facebook. I read today that the Carolina Panthers have signed their first transgender cheerleader. I mean, you know, I don't even know what to say anymore. I don't know. We, have, yeah. we have people, that we have at football games, the NFL mm -hmm. will have women or transgender, whatever they are, people mm -hmm. in drag on the sidelines celebrating touchdowns and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is the way the world is, is coming to. Uh, I have a friend who watches the uh, the show Lucifer, and uh, she uh, asked me the question: Well, is Jesus and, uh, and Lucifer brothers? And 
you know, I said, no, not really. You know, Jesus, son of God, begotten, not made, Lucifer, fallen angel. You know, his greatest sin was pride uh, and Jesus was sinless. No, they're not brothers at all. And, you know, it's a teaching from the Mormon church that has shown up in the uh, uh, a regular Hollywood TV show. Now, God can use these things. He can use evil for good. We've seen this many times, and uh, hopefully this will be a great time to, to talk to this person about uh, their faith, you know, because they're interested now after it was piqued by this show. Who knows? Who knows? But yeah, th this is what is being fed. Uh, it's not just the Joe Olsteins. It's the Hollywood fiction of Jesus and Lucifer that is being fed to the minds out there as just regular garbly gook. And nobody has the, the biblical understanding anymore to know what's real and not real. Uh, what is true Christian doctrine? What isn't true to Christian doctrine? And well, it, well, the enemy is pretty confused about true yeah. Christian doctrine because yeah. this yesterday, uh, two days ago, Sunday, some abortion activists interrupted a Joel Osteen service in Houston, <laughs> protesting <laughs> the pro-abortion. And I got to tell you, I don't think Joel Osteen doesn't touch with a ten-foot pole homosexuality, abortion, yeah. any yeah. of this stuff. And they're trying to break up a Joel Osteen. Your best life now. Give me your money, sermon. Uh, they, they, wrong, wrong church girls. Wrong try church. again. Uh, oh man! Down so, the street. Try another one. Uh, all right. Oh. So that's our first story, George. Uh, we'll have to see what happens in reaction to Justin Welby's letter to the archbishops who aren't going to uh, Lambeth. You and I have discussed this. We would support them going to Lambeth because they would have the numbers to overturn or set straight Lambeth and propose choosing a different way to have uh, the arch, not the archbishop, but the leader of the Anglican communion chosen. My point being here is Justin Welby, it's too late to complain. You brought together a, a, a primates meeting years ago, um, or a primates gathering it was at the time, and all the primates decided that they're going to hold uh, the uh, Episcopal Church accountable for uh, what it did with Gene Robinson and some of the changings of its Christian doctrines. And, and you agreed to be the person who would hold the Episcopal Church accountable for three years. You didn't do it. Nobody trusts you anymore to hold anybody accountable. The primates of Africa, the primates in Gafcon, uh, conservative primates around the world don't want to be associated with you anymore. This is your fault. All you had to do was just ask Tech to stand down for three years, and you could have demanded they show up to, to Lambeth, and they would have had no choice. No choice at all, because you held the church accountable. You blew it. You had one job, George, Justin. All right, let's move on. Next story. Let's talk about Charlie Holt. Charlie Holt is the Bishop of Black to the Episcopal Diocese of Florida. He's mm -hmm. a long term, long known for 20 years. I consider him a friend. Charlie was the most conservative of the candidates for election to be Bishop of Florida, and he won the ballot. And I saw this as a movement of the Holy Spirit restoring the Diocese of Florida to the days of Steve Jekko and uh, his oh, greatness. Wow. Yeah, sure. well, it's a pretty good diocese yeah. anyway, but still it can be better. Well, uh, immediately after his election, some ch a challenge was formally made to the election. And this is the third time in the Episcopal Church's history that this has been done. Once in Haiti and once in Central mm -hmm. Ecuador. Okay. Yeah. No, not with Mark Lawrence. Okay. No. no, this is completely different. This is where delegates from within the diocese filed a challenge. It only happened in Ecuador and Haiti, and now Florida. Okay. Well, what happened was uh, the chancellor and the bishop, Sam Howard, made an executive decision saying that there we have a number of elderly clergy who are afraid of COVID, and they're not going to be able to come. And if they don't come, we won't have a quorum to conduct business. So we will allow them to participate via Zoom. But lay delegates to the convention uh, must be there in person. And the thinking was a lay delegate has an alternate from their parish. So if they can't come for health reasons, somebody else can come in their place. And this was announced and duly adopted the convention. Well, 10% of, of a 10% uh, 
whether it's 10 people or 10 percent i have to look said uh after the vote was over after they lost the liberals lost they filed a formal objection saying we needed to have 30 days notice we needed you know they filed procedural objections this went up to presiding bishop michael curry and yesterday it was announced that curry will accept the challenge and begin a process of examining it so charlie holt's uh consecration which was scheduled for october has now been pushed to january tentatively meanwhile the gay lobby is contacting standing committees and bishops around the country saying charlie holt is as a homophobe vote against him now i don't think that's likely to win but what we're seeing uh win and i don't believe charlie holt will be penalized by the decision of uh the chancellor and sam howard but what we're saying is it's it's it's, it's a problem we see in the united states in the political sphere uh if a liberal wins the election it's fair if they lose it's unfair uh well, yeah and therefore it, it, it's it a stolen challenged. election so th- clearly they believe that the dice of florida is a stolen election and there's just a lack of graciousness and a, a lack, and an intolerance by the left Charlie is one of the nicest, kindest. He is not a doctrinaire, hard-nosed conservative who you know takes no prisoners. He truly is a man of God and is spirit-filled. Um, mm-hmm. Yet he's being attacked for allegedly not being sensitive enough to racial minorities and to sexual minorities. And they'll make up stories as well as as they do in the secular press. Um, it's. It's difficult because I see what they just did with Bishop of Albany, uh, um, Bishop Love, you know, who finally had to throw in the towel and leave uh, the Episcopal Church and go on to the ACNA. Um, is this something that may happen to Charlie Holt as well? May he, he just not be consecrated or you think it will go through? Well, the attack, the, uh, the push against Bishop uh, Love was because he directly challenged the authority of the general convention i'm not going to get in whether he was right in doing this or not but he believed he was right i believe he and was right whole, it's, it's a different discussion we had a whole lot we had a hot had a old trial and everything hmm. uh charlie holt is not challenging uh the general convention he will abide by the rulings of general convention he's a man under authority um but he will work to proclaim the teachings of jesus christ be faithful to the doctrine once received by the saints and if we have a parish that wants to have gay weddings charlie will probably say okay general convention says you can do this but i'll need to give you alternative episcopal oversight because i really can't be part of this because i think it's wrong now i'm surmising with charlie yeah i've not seen an interview or his thoughts on this we're surmising but but uh, knowing Charlie as I do, I think he would be able to work for a way forward where he honors both the general convention and the diocesan rule. Central Florida, we have this. Uh, in the search process, a candidate to be elected the next bishop in succession to Greg Brewer says, will you honor the diocesan uh, canon, which requires sexual relations to be within male-female marriage? And will you honor the general convention's requirement that all parishes uh, permit same-sex weddings so long as it doesn't interfere with the prerogatives of the rector. And basically, Central Florida's candidates are saying yes, yes, and yes. We've got a conflict of laws. We just find a have to way to make them work. But uh, we don't have individually the authority to stand outside of the systems which we promise to serve. Mm-hmm. That being said, I think Charlie because he's a genuinely nice guy and i think the house of bishops just doesn't want this fight right now because they're conscious conscious of the great decline and fall off in attendance and just more bad news is just not what the episcopal church needs nationally the gay lobby on the other hand uh, they have only one issue and everything is seen for that one issue and they've had some great success in the last 10 years in the in the church, in the Episcopal Church, in the Evangelical Church, in wokeness, uh, and certainly in, in the secular society, since we allowed uh, at the Supreme Court level level for same sex weddings, so um, there's just no stopping, and that's why I say, you know, you and I thought 
Bishop Love would stick it out in the Episcopal Church. Um, at least I thought that. And I kind of, I, I want to think that Charlie Holt will succeed in this. But I think there, this, the LGTB lobby right now is on a win-win-win uh, scenario, and they may not stop. They'll find some way to get get them out. It just what I'm seeing is the the evil one has much more influence uh, in secular society and in the church than uh, I think we are we are assuming. So, but at the same time, maybe the cynical part of me says, "Follow the money, sure. follow the money," yeah. and at a certain and the money is not, you know, the diocese of New York is, is not sharing its riches with the Episcopal Church. Okay. Um, People are holding on to their cash, and we're going to be entering a severe economic downturn, I believe. And so I think the old ways of doing things, of just putting principle, if you're a gay per if you're a gay activist, ahead of everything else, are going to have to be tamed by the fact that there's no money to play these games anymore. Keep it in your prayers, people. Let's move on and talk about the ALCU, the Anglican Lutheran Church, whatever. Evangelical. Yes. Evangelical <laughs> Lutheran Church of America. <sighs> oh my. Well, I, could, and people know I'm always in over my head, so it's not uh, too surprising I screwed that up. Uh, they have a trans bishop. That trans bishop is no longer employed, George. We reported about Megan Rohr. Megan mm -hmm. Rohr is uh, the first uh, mainline, mainstream, transgender bishop. She refers to herself by the pronoun they. Uh, and so I'll just be polite and use her pronoun. It also sounds silly, too, when I use it. But they got in trouble a few months ago, last December, when she fired the vicar of a Hispanic congregation on... Uh, our Lady of Guadalupe or some yeah, Mexican holiday. It was a holiday. Mexican spiritual holiday, yes. Yeah. Day, Day of the Dead, something like that. Yeah. And the congregation took great offense at this because they were taken by surprise and she came and talked to them and she had a miserable time and she was accused of racism. And an investigation was launched and the fired priest took his congregation out of the Lutheran Church, an independent Lutheran Church, just a stink and a report was written that investigated this and found that the bishop they uh mishandled the whole situation elizabeth eaton the presiding bishop of the lutheran church asked her to resign on saturday they resigned on sunday the lutheran bishops met via zoom and a statement was issued Monday morning where Elizabeth Eaton says, we're going ahead with ecclesiastical proceedings again today uh, because we're not telling you exactly what it is, but she did something really, really bad that just her quitting as bishop is won't take care of it. Now, her supporters have written that uh, Bishop Rohr is also autistic and perhaps uh, her uh, lack of facial, uh, facial uh, response, response to yeah. angry... His angry Hispanic members of the congregation, perhaps her inability to relate to people of a different culture is medically based, mm -hmm. not uh, an evidence of bad character. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you think we've got a bad in the Anglican world, the poor Lutherans, the, an autistic transgender bishop who's mean to Hispanics and has been fired for racism. Oh my goodness. Um, I, no, and I, what a world in which we live. You no, know, and I remember talking to in our, uh, a senior bishop in the Lutheran Church, um, not the ELCU, but uh, and he said he can't get any good seminarians anymore. All the seminarians who come out of the Lutheran seminarians are uh, experts on climate change, experts on uh, gender. Um, nouns, experts on uh, all these social justice issues, and haven't read the New Testament, don't really know their role as a future clergy person. And he couldn't name one good Lutheran seminary. And when I, we had ran this story about two years ago about the first transgendered bishop, I remember, yeah, Lutheran, I remember what he said, yeah, there's, and they don't. They don't have good seminaries, George. All right, let's move on. Talking about, we, we covered that story. 
covered that story. Uh, we've got a bad story to cover, George, and that's the shooting in Nigeria in what was once a safe place in their country. Um, it was unheard of to have any type of violence uh, at the, the jihadist level in this, this area. And I, we need to talk about it because, and I, you and I discussed this at least a year ago, that like Sudan, Nigeria is going to fall. And we're not too far from that now. St. Francis Roman Catholic Church in Owo, which is in the Ondo State. And the Ondo State is in the southwestern corner near the coast. This is a region that has not had any of the experience of uh, Boko Haram or Fulani tribes bend or even criminal gangs. This is nice Nigeria, safe Nigeria, 90% plus Christian Nigeria with 10% pagans still around. Mm -hmm. On Pentecost Sunday, Fulani tribesmen, these are the Muslim herders who have been wreaking havoc in the middle belt uh, of Nigeria, murdering Christians and villages and whatnot. They burst into St. Francis Church, opened fire, bombs went off, 50 plus people are killed, many more wounded. And this is a, this is as shocking as if we had a, a Ku Klux Klan cross burning in Burlington, Vermont. Oh, yeah. you know, it just doesn't happen in there. Mm -hmm. And this has caused a great deal of, this has caused a great deal of soul searching in Nigeria. Henry Nbikuba, the primate of Nigeria, gave a televised address press conference yesterday, Monday, where he said Nigeria is slipping, sliding into being a failed state, just like Sudan had become. Um, where the government is unable to maintain the rule of law and the smart people in nigeria are saying is that what's going on is that there are forces that are trying to go back to the bad old days of martial law when the army ran things the army's leadership is primarily muslim so that the army seizes power seizes the, the wealth of the country for its own benefit and people acquiesce with this because they're not safe in their homes or churches anymore because of these tribesmen and once the army takes control, boom, the tribesmen will no longer be a problem. That's right. It's like, boom, once Joe Biden was elected, BLM is not going to riot. That's the sort of thinking that's going on. Or there are other people who are saying, oh, well, this is even deeper than that, that uh, this is a plot by the Christian South to have an outrage to make sure that no Muslim is ever elected president of Nigeria again. I think that's a bit much. I, I don't think that's true. I, um, it, now, it was nice to read that the president of Nigeria had a, a very strong statement about that. You know, what, what happened. You know, he is Muslim, but uh, Muhammad gave a statement that said, this is, this is so wrong. And, um, yeah, but they're like Justin Welby statements. You know, Justin Welby had a nice statement. Oh, this is did. terrible. But yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't really mean anything no, because their credibility is so poor. What means something to me coming out of all this is something I read uh, that I, I wrote a little article on a friend, you know, the Bishop of Yola, uh, which is in uh, the northeast of Nigeria, which is Muslim territory. Uh, Marcus Amfani uh, wrote a letter saying the Christian response to these Muslims persecutions. And he wrote this on Saturday in response to the murder of Deborah Samuel, the Nigerian university student who was martyred and burned alive on university campus for proclaiming Jesus Christ as God and Muhammad isn't. He wrote in response to that, um, the Christian response is forbearance and love. We are to love our enemies. Mm -hmm. So when they murder us, we don't murder them. Now you can say, well, somebody, you know, if a Christian minister in the United States says that, well, you know, you're sitting comfortably at your desk in Florida, you're in no danger of murder. In uh, Yola, um, they've had suicide bombings from Boko Haram. They've had children and adopt, kidnapped from schools. It's on the front lines in the war with militant Islam and jihadists. Mm -hmm. And here Bishop Amfani is preaching the words of Jesus Christ. He's not saying open the doors to Boko Haram and let them do what they want, but rather return love for the evil done to us. Right. To me, that's encouraging to see someone on the front lines preaching what I believe to be the true gospel in this situation. And that's something we saw, you know, back in the 90s in Rwanda, the Christian response to, you know, the genocide there and all the other atrocities that happened in East and West Africa. The Christian response is always love your enemy. 
we are not going to fight this with weapons. We're going to fight this as a spiritual battle because that's what it is. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we can see a uh, renaissance of the Christian faith in Nigeria over this. All right, on to our next story. Englishman, future clergyman, Calvin Robinson is in the news. He published some emails uh, from Justin Welby and uh, uh, his underlings that uh, kind of reveal that Justin Welby misled, I don't want to use the word lied, his involvement in the, the Calvinson Robinson, and I'll call it at this point, the affair, the, 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 uh, the ongoings of the story. Well, we will say that Justin was not entirely straightforward. Forward, yes. Which <laughs> less well, than or true for, for. <laughs> or for the clickbait title, Justin lied. The church has died. Oh, uh, <laughs> what's going on? Uh, Justin Welby gave an interview, I think, to a television station, and one of the questions asked of him was his involvement in the Calvin Robinson affair. Calvin mm -hmm. Robinson is a an articulate young uh, black man uh, who is uh, was an ordinand uh, for ordination in the uh, Diocese of London, He's trained at St. Stephen's House. He also is a very uh, prominent television uh, talk uh, talking head. Talking head, sure. He's very popular. Yeah. He's very articulate. He's yeah. very charismatic. He, he's somebody with a tremendous career ahead of him. Well, yeah, hold on, but, but he also he, he knows his stuff. There's lots of talking heads who just talk. Calvin Robinson happens to really know what he's talking about and talks about it from the conservative standpoint. And it's amazing to watch some of the people who are, who are asking the questions and boom, he has the answer. And that's different than just a talking head. Well, Calvin was torpedoed by the Diocese of London for ordination. It started off with the Bishop of Edmonton with whom he had a personal relationship. He served as the Bishop of Edmonton's uh, children's tutor for, in their computer classes when he was a teacher. Uh, torpedoed uh, Robinson by saying, you have to look at his uh, tweets, he's politically conservative. We don't want that sort to be a clergyman in London. I won't take him, so on and so forth. Bishop of London had a meeting with him where she said, uh, Calvin, 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 you just, I'm a white woman and I can tell you, the Church of England is hopelessly racist, institutionally racist. Calvin disagreed, but he then was torpedoed. Well, Justin Welby was asked on uh, television, do you have anything to do with this? He said, no, 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 I don't, I know nothing. I know nothing. He did a, for American viewers, he did a Sergeant Schultz. He knew nothing. Well, Calvin is a clever fellow, and he had gotten through uh, the British equivalent of the Freedom of Information Act, but it applies to private uh, entities as well, copies of email correspondence. Emma Ineson, the assistant bishop at Canterbury, who acts as sort of the canon to the ordinary, or the Archbishop of Canterbury and Archbishop of York, uh, has an email conversations with the Bishop of London, and, she, and Ineson said, I'm going to inform Justin. And then there's a second email where it says Justin wants to see examples of these tweets that uh, Calvin has put out that are that uh, attack a political anti, anti woke. Well, yeah, the anti woke t tweets. So here's the problem we have. Justin Welby last week was on about jo Boris Johnson, the prime minister, has to resign because he lied to the gut to the country about. Uh, partying during COVID lockdowns. Therefore, he can't be trusted, and he's a liar, he must go. And Nick Baines, the Bishop of Leeds, and the Bishop of Buckingham, of all, all the political bishops have put their oar into this and are stirring up the waters, saying, Johnson has to go because he's a liar. Well, the good old hypocrite Justin Welby has now been demonstrated to be a liar. Or it is alleged he's a liar. <laughs> That's it. Case. it. We'll do that. Okay. It's a have, have, have Alan basically go through and, and at a certain point just go beep if the wrong thing is said. <laughs> yes, there's accusations. It, well, it, we're accusing it him. How's that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, it is in our opinion. Yes. We believe that Justin Welby was not entirely straightforward in his interview, mm -hmm. and I find it hypocritical mm -hmm. that he calls for the leader of the government, who is a politician. And I have to say, nobody expects a politician. Truth all the time. 
to stay. The sort of lie or Absolutely. misstatement yeah. of truth. No. Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. And, and having had to deal with some legal issues uh, in the earlier part of the year, we're going to use accused more often. Absolutely. Now, he, here's the thing. I mean, Justin Welby is asking for several hundred million pounds out of the church commissioners to reinvigorate and revitalize and bring more people back into the Church of England. Mm -hmm. And it'll probably work out they'll get one new person for every million pounds spent uh, because the money's all going to climate change and more assistant uh, art deacons and women's advisors and transgender advisors and all this mm -hmm. and that. And the people in the pews are basically crying out saying, you know, you're taxing us to death, you're destroying our historical parish structures, you're sending us uh, these ill-educated, woke clergy. The conservative clergy are being driven out of our diocese and parishes. It's got to stop, Justin. It cannot continue the way it's going. Absolutely. I mean, Bad when you, situation in the Church of England. And it, it's that wonderful contrast. The church and the operation of the church and the purpose of the church is bound by love. The purpose of woke is bound by hate. Okay. And the, so you're setting these people who are designing equality into the, the senior leadership in the church. Uh, it, it's not going to help, George. There's an old saying in the American South. Uh, that you know if your state ranks number 49th in education or health or welfare there's always mississippi there's always somebody worse off than you in america it's always mississippi yeah. well the church of england has its mississippi and that's called the church in wales the church in wales <laughs> that's right <laughs> i forgot uh, the church in wales is the mississippi of the anglican communion I, well that's not fair to mississippi because yes. uh, <laughs> mississippi the diocese is doing okay uh but the church they just had on We've just finished four days of celebration of Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Our British viewers will have had wall-to-wall -wall coverage for four days. Our American viewers will have seen 30 seconds on and, the scroll and underneath everything, the news. And everything we watched dealt with Meghan and Harry. And Harry and Meghan. Yeah. yeah we didn't see well, a lot I of Jubilee coverage, you, but... <laughs> and if, if you didn't know anymore, the Jubilee was for Meghan and Harry going That's back right. to England. But... Uh, <laughs> Well, on Friday, uh, Justin will be COVID and couldn't preach at the service at St. Paul's Cathedral on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, came and did the sermon, and it was pretty good for Stephen Cottrell. I liked it. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to be a monarchist to have loved it. I'm not a monarchist, um, but it was good. He didn't He didn't do a Catherine Jeffrey Shorey and talk about, you know, oh, I miss her, Kevin. I just miss her, <laughs> the, right. the joy we would have from her work. Well, it was okay. And in looking at the, uh, the, the newspapers all printed, the, the service bulletins, and the order of service, and all of the religious leaders of England were there. You had the, you know, the Stephen Cottrell, the Church of England was represented, the Bishop of London, the head of the Scottish Episcopal Church, the head of the Church of Scotland, the head of the Church of Ireland, uh, the Methodist leader, the Catholic Cardinals, the Muslim leaders, the Sikh leaders, all were there except for the church in Wales. Andy John, the bishop, uh, primate of Wales, sent a representative. Well, and the representative uh, senior bishop, said, right? No, he did not send Gregory Cameron, Cameron, who at this time is senior bishop uh, by term of uh, time in office. He sent the most junior bishop his assistant, uh, Emma Stollard, um, Emma Willard, that's a girl's school, Emma, uh, <laughs> well, right. <laughs> he sent the most junior bishop to, to represent the church in Wales. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to ask myself, now, there's no announcement that, oh, he has COVID, yeah. oh, his mother-in-law died, oh, his child is under having surgery today. The church in Wales could not be bothered to send its primate to the most basically important church service that will occur during Andy John's lifetime. Oh, yeah, bar none. Platinum bar Jubilee. none. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what are we being told? Is the church in Wales devoutly Republican? 
in an English sense, not in an American sense, meaning they're anti-monarchy. Is the church in Wales just so screwed up that they can't even get their act together to do something just for PR purposes? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, it's you got it. Church in Wales has got it, you know it's rapidly approaching the point where it has more bishops and archdeacons than people in the pews, yeah. and this sort of decision to slight to snub the queen, ah, uh, maybe it's fashionable. I don't know I don't. for the smart people, but man, Church of England just has to say thank God for the Church in Wales, thank God for Mississippi. Mississippi, yes. Well, and we celebrate this too. I mean. Uh, the Jubilee for the Queen and the Queen represents clearly the greatest generation that's what we call the the World War two generation um, where she was uh, enthroned uh, about that time and she was a, a leader in the world in the time of Ronald Reagan Mikhail Gorbachev uh, Margaret Threat Thatcher John Paul II and Help change the world, Joseph, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you go back far enough, <laughs> <Mao Zedong. laughs> yeah, well, she helped fight that. But she she has remained an incredible Christian woman, an incredible Christian royal, an incredible Christian leader, uh, especially within uh, the UK for the you know a jubilee, a, a lifetime. And it's it, it's amazing to watch, and she is the last symbol of that great, greatest generation. And I, I, you know, I hope she uh, ha has received that honor from the, the prizes of her people and around the world for the, the time she served so faithfully. And uh, I, I, if you get the chance to to watch it, there's a great clip with her in Paddington. Uh, just go on YouTube and, and type uh, Queen of England in Paddington or Jubilee in Paddington. Um, so Paddington uh, Bear, not the train station. I'm sorry, in, yeah, uh, London, to, <laughs> to my daughters, he was just Paddington, but okay, Paddington Bear. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, what what a great way to celebrate her wonderful life and uh, just a great leadership she's provided for her country through bad times and good times. You know, I remember the death of Di and uh, Princess Di and uh, the controversies and some of the things she's had to struggle through uh, with her family <laughs> and uh, over the years. And I think she's done a wonderful job. And her Christmas messages are the most Christian thing you'll see out of Europe uh, by far. All right. Do we have any more stories here, George? I think we got a couple more. This oh, episode Kevin, we, long. we Oh, Chicago. This is oh. going like, and we've got we've got stuff yeah. that on a normal week would we've had three or four things we should have headline our things. Oh yeah, absolutely sure. Uh, mm. One of them is the situation in Chicago. Yeah, let's. Uh, the Chicago Sun Times published a story this past week uh, revealing that the Diocese of Chicago had settled a civil lawsuit, paid a someone seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for having mishandled sexual abuse claims this stuff is bad folks uh we have a link to the chicago sun times article on the uh anglicanic website here's the story in 1986 uh 87 a new priest went to st bride's church in oregon i think it's oregon illinois mm -hmm. uh which is near rockford illinois I don't so know it's where that northwest is. of chicago okay near you kevin where you are right <laughs> now <somewhere>. yeah <laughs> This new pre new vicar priest in charge learned soon as she got to her church that her predecessor, a man named Robert Kearney, had been fiddling with boys and teenagers, sexually mm -hmm. abusing them. Mm -hmm. She went to the diocesan offices and spoke to the canon to the ordinary, a woman named Chilton Knudsen. And the bishop is Frank Griswold. She told Chilton Knudsen, who later would become Bishop of Maine, and has been assisting bishop in all sorts of places and incidentally co-wrote the church's guide to dealing with sexual abuse application uh, accusation she told children newtson of these uh claims of abuse newtson responded by inviting her to have a psychiatric evaluation and sending her to a psychiatric clinic for three days three whole days yeah. You bring, uh, you bring a question about the sexual misconduct of your predecessor, the first action is the, the scan of the ordinary sends you to see a psych if you're crazy, psychiatrist. Yeah. No, that well, didn't make it, crazy. That did, but that didn't make it to the current rules that he wrote for the Episcopal Church. She wrote, she wrote. <laughs> she, I'm sorry, she, she wrote. Newton's a woman, yeah. Kevin. Yes, I know, I didn't, I, uh, I knew that, oh my God. 
So, oh, yeah. But, and so when she's out of the psych ward, Newton says, well, I'll take care of this. Well, the priest is now at a new church in Waukegan, which I think is in, in Illinois. Waukegan, mm-hmm. Illinois? Someplace like that. Right. And three years later, the youth, a new youth minister, is talking to some teens, and one of them is having a bad time with drugs and this and that. And she learns that the priest had been molesting him. She goes to Chilton Newtson, and Chilton Newtson hears the report, says, and does nothing. Then a parent, a few weeks later, goes to the police. I think that's Lake County or some or Kane yeah. County or whatever it is, to, and and reports this pervert pedophile priest. Once the police report is filed, Newton Newton and Frank Griswold step into action and, and dis, you know defrock him and do all this sort of stuff and say lessons will be learned, blah blah blah. And now they've had to pay seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for their basically covering up this pedophile Robert Kearney. They knew he was a pervert, and he moved to a new parish. They didn't tell the new parish anything. They made the whistleblower have a psychiatric examination. And this is the Episcopal Church. This sounds like Roman Catholic stuff during the bad old days. Yeah, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the, to, to rule the priest out. Absolutely. Now, the question is, will charges be brought against uh, Chilton Newton and Frank Griswold? for clear misconduct, not reporting it to the police. You know, George Carey, for far less, far less, he was the principal of a, of a theological college when they had a part-time day student uh, named Jonathan Smythe, John Smythe. Yeah. Uh, he's, lost his license he's hammered. To serve. Yeah. He, he lost his license to serve in the Diocese of Oxford. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he he was going to come here in 2019 to help us to mar- have us celebrate our 25th anniversary mm-hmm. and he was refused a license by greg brewer the bishop of central florida because he's still under a cloud and uh i'm still mad about that but yes uh, you should be i mean the, the hypocrisy and, here is amazing and chilton newton goes on and frank griswold goes on to be presiding bishop newton goes on to be bishop of maine mm-hmm. comfortable secure retirements occasional gigs as assisting bishops uh, in dioceses that are in transition. And they engaged in behavior that has cost the Catholic Church billions of dollars, not an exaggeration, hundreds of millions of dollars in litigation and lawsuits and yeah. bankruptcy of dioceses. I think you're correct to, to say billions, you know, if you want to go over the 30-year period and all the litigation and lawsuits that they lost you're looking at at least a billion dollars for the Roman Catholic Church here in America alone, you know. Um, and, and I think the sin a- they committed in, in uh, passing this guy on to another church or just not reporting it is as great as this man's sin. He was arrested. He served time in prison, which is wonderful. Um, uh, he admits to the crime. He admitted to it uh, when uh, he was arrested. So... Mm. And and coincidentally there's another story in the chicago sun times which has broken the, some great stories on the episcopal church lately mm-hmm. diocese chicago is trying to sell its downtown office building on huron street next to cathedral they're asking about 20 million dollars now they've tried to sell it two times before and as the reporter talked to a commercial property a broker saying Episcopal church its diocese picks the worst times to try to sell property they tried to sell it in 20, 2003 when we had the, uh, and then again in uh, t- 2000, uh, when we had the financial meltdown in 2008. Each time they put it on the market is when the market's tanking. And now that's a commercial property market in Chicago is tanking because nobody wants to build. This is perfect for one of these, you know, 100 story sky rise apartments, office towers. Sure. Uh, it's a low-rise building in downtown Chicago, lovely part of town. Um, now they're trying to sell it again, and unless a speculator comes along and get it dirt cheap, 
that uh, that I don't think it'll sell. But the article in the Sun Times made the point is they need the money. Yeah, the, it will. I don't see why it, yeah. they need the yeah. money. They, they they really need. The, why well, do they what, need the money? Just the re- reason the same the reason the Diocese of Connecticut sold their wonderful uh, headquarters. They needed the money. Now they work in a small building where they rent space. Um, you know the several dioceses, and we talked about this about Michigan and the consolidation going on here in Wisconsin, uh, the dioceses are becoming very poor. I know that 815 is doing well because it's still supported by Trinity Wall Street, but um, at some point there's going to be very little money uh, to, to help them get out of these types of situation. Uh, we have a couple more stories, but we're going to have to cut it short. we got five minutes before we hit the hour mark, and let's just talk about going to jail uh, for going and putting biblical verses on Twitter. And we covered this before that uh, a couple of people from what country are they from, George? Finland. 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 So I don't speak the language. I would mispronounce their names horribly. They were brought up on charges of a hate crime, homophobia for uh, uh, posting biblical passages on Twitter that talked about what God and Jesus and the New Testament and what Christians should think of um, homosexuality and they won but there's a follow up George it's a Bishop Polhani I think that's how you pronounce it of the Evangelical Lutheran Missionary Church mm-hmm. of Finland that's akin to the ACNA in Finland they broke off from the Church of Finland and Lassi Rasanen who is a, form, is a woman former Minister of the Interior a devout Christian married to a Lutheran minister of this breakaway church. Uh, in response to statements about homosexuality and same sex marriage, they promoted their view and they justified their view that it was wrong based upon their understanding of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Because of this, charges of hate crimes were brought against them by the public prosecutor. The public prosecutor waged their case, its case, and lost it lost so much that it was forced to pay the legal fees of the two well in finland in the united states if a prosecutor loses that's it you can't appeal well, the, pro- the defendant can always appeal the prosecutor yes. can't appeal. in some cases they can but unless in, there's unless yeah. there's misca- unless there's like bribery of the jurors <laughs> or the judge in other words unless there's a failing with the system system yeah you know if the case is not proven double jeopardy boom they're off the hook Finland, the prosecutor, can appeal a judge's and jury's verdict if they don't like it. And the Court of Appeals has ruled that the prosecution has made a case and is allowing them to retry the whole thing. So they could conceivably face tens of thousands of dollars in fines and perhaps uh, jail time for insulting the homosexual community by citing scripture as the re- basis of their beliefs that God did not intend for men and women to engage in same-sex genital behavior, uh, sexual relations. Yeah. <sighs> Just take a big sigh. This, this is the, the unscripted where you, at the end, you take a big sigh, George. You look like you have more news. Kevin, I mean, we've talked about, <laughs> no, we well, we've got plenty more news. No, uh, but, no, you know, we've no, talked no. about transgender cheerleaders. <laughs> yes. We've talked about, uh, <laughs> we've really run the run the gamut on this thing. But, yeah. Kevin, when you're typing up, well, be died, the ch- well, be lied, the church died. Uh, we've discovered uh, the value of clickbait uh, yeah, titles. Oh, uh, man. We, we know what, uh, what YouTube and uh, Google will promote and, and Facebook. And anything that says dying church is a you will find that on your, your news feed on those. So I've got to start rethinking my titles. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 735 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>